the industry was expecting alignment with the existing CPS220 requirements to a large extent, and as a result, many organisations have undertaken some form of readiness review. What about for organisations that haven't? Where do you suggest that they start? Renee, there's four main components of a good risk management framework and the first one is, is probably the most difficult one and it is you know, risk culture and really getting the board and senior management to focus on what is the key message around risk culture for the organisation. The second one is looking at what is the risk appetite of the organisation and looking at the tolerances of the organisation as well around those key material risks that have been identified. And that's always difficult as well. It sounds an easy thing to do, but actually when you sit down at the board level particularly and work out you know, what are the tolerances, it, it, it often takes a bit more time. But most organisations, when they've gone through the process, have said what a worthwhile exercise that has been. The third one is identifying those risk strategies and really trying, those key material risks, and really trying to embed those into the risk strategy. What we're seeing much more now is that organisations are involving risk as BAU, that they're involved in the strategic decision making, which typically for less mature organisations on the risk management framework journey, they haven't been involved to the, to the greater extent. So we're seeing better decision making when risk is being brought to the table in strategic decisions. The other thing that um, hasn't been focused on, which now we're seeing a lot more focus on, how do you actually get the right management information for the board? How can they see that the risk culture is being embedded? How can they see that the risk appetite is actually being um, communicated through the organisation? So having a look at what information is available to the board and looking at improvements. We're seeing now a much greater use of thing, tools like dashboards, which can really give a really nice um, summary to the board of how the organisation is looking at the key material risks. So CPS220 will be effective for private health insurers from 1 April 2018, but it's actually been in place for a number of years for other APRA regulated ADIs and life and general insurers. So with that in mind um, and your work with those organisations, can you share with us some of the key learnings and things perhaps that they might have done differently if they had their time again? I think what we've found with many organisations, Renee, is that it's very difficult to articulate um, what the risk culture of the firm is. So that's where it's really important for the board and senior management to take a, a leading role and lead by example and, and, and really get out there and talk to staff about what they believe is the risk appetite and the risk tolerances of their organisation. Looking at this beyond a compliance lens, how have organisations used the implementation of CPS220 as an opportunity to move beyond that and get some value for the organisation? What we've seen is a, a more clearer definition of the three lines of defence. And in a recent PwC survey, we found that 63% of respondents found that actually embedding uh, risk management and risk into the front line actually has enabled their organisations to be more agile and actually have better risk decisioning. And Sarah, if we can just take a moment to think about risk management more broadly, do you have a sense of whether APRA is likely to, with the focus on risk culture, push that further across the business, um, potentially remuneration? And also perhaps just your thoughts on BEAR and whether that's likely to apply to insurers and, and health insurers further down the track. There's certainly a greater emphasis um, by APRA around culture, remuneration and governance. And in fact, they've actually created a new division within APRA that is purely focusing on that. And what we're seeing with the introduction of the Banking Executive Accountability Regime is a clear focus on the link between accountability, governance, remuneration even. So, and yes, I do believe that we're going to see a broadening of this, um, this prudential regulation across into financial services more broadly. And APRA has stated that intention. How that will happen, we're still not sure. Um, we're still expecting you know, the, the final legislation on the bear to be released imminently, um, but I imagine we will see further prudential regulation um, from APRA.